Hey, this is Mike Matthews from MuscleForLife.com and in this short video, I want to talk to you about pre-workout drinks. Uh, specifically, I want to talk to you about what I do and don't like about them and what type of ingredients I like to see in uh, a pre-workout drink and which pre-workout drink I use personally. So first, let's talk about uh, kind of the the pre-workout scam, I guess you could say, because pre-workout drinks um, are very profitable. These types of products are very profitable because uh, you can spend very little on the manufacturing of them and using certain types of stimulants uh, that you know are, are pretty cheap to get in terms of raws. You can produce a product that gives people uh, you know a jolt of energy, uh, and you don't have to spend a lot of money to to, to make it, but. Personally, I don't like the very stim heavy type of uh, pre-workouts because I don't like that feeling. You know, you get the, the jitters and you get uh, that sort of anxiety almost attack that you, I don't know if you've ever felt that before, but in the past, you know, trying all the different type of pre-workouts that have been on the market, some of them really made me feel uncomfortable, my heart racing, stuff like that. And then also, you know, we see uh, news stories coming out like crazed having the, the meth analog and uh, I think there was another story just recently, uh, a few other pre-workouts on the market, I don't remember which ones, also have the same molecule or similar molecules. So, uh, you know, Jack, the original Jack or Jack 3D or whatever is uh, what it had the uh, DMAA. So in some cases you don't really know what you're even putting in your body, which also kind of sketched me out. But that's, that's more on the, I mean, that, that's kind of like the egregious offenders. What you'll more commonly see in pre-workouts is uh, you'll see that they use ingredients that have no science behind them. There's no scientific proof that you know, the, these ingredients are going to improve performance whatsoever. Um, a lot of times it's amino acids, uh, it could be BCAAs or other amino acids that aren't necessarily bad, but they're not going to improve your ability to train. They're not going to give you more energy. They're not going to, you know, in increase muscle endurance or strength or anything else. But, you know, they do fill up the nutrition labels. So when you see those proprietary blends, which I hate proprietary blends, when companies are, you know, when you see proprietary blend, just know that you're basically being ripped off. That's the only reason you use proprietary blend is to hide the actual amounts of ingredients in the product because there's so little that if you knew how little there actually was, you wouldn't, you know, it'd be obvious if you saw there's five milligrams of something, you would know, well, you know, what's five milligrams really going to do? But when you see it as this proprietary blend that has 30 different ingredients or 15 different ingredients or whatever, uh, it just makes it sound more legit. And it's just a, it's a point of salesmanship. But um, when you have the long labels where it looks like you're getting a lot for your money, that's it's just the, the supplement companies are just trying to uh, change your perception. That's all they're trying to make you, you know, look at the, the back of the product and go, oh, wow, look at how much I'm getting for all my money. So another thing that I don't like with pre-workouts is more a marketing point, um, and that is citing misinterpreted studies. Uh, to prove the effectiveness uh, of certain ingredients or flawed studies or kind of cherry-picked studies. Um, in some cases, it's animal research, you know, research done with rats. In other cases, it's research done with the elderly or it's research done with AIDS patients that have muscle wasting issues or whatever. Um, not well-designed, well-executed research conducted with healthy adults and ideally uh, healthy adults that are also um, into exercising, uh, ideally, ideally be resistance trained, depending on the product, really. I mean, if you're talking about like a muscle related product to be resistance trained, um, but minimally at least healthy adults, not people with diseases or just animals. Uh, so a lot of companies will take those studies though, that are with animals or just poorly designed, you know, biased and be from, from funding sources and whatever, and use those studies to sell you on why the ingredients they're using are beneficial. And then right on the heels of that is uh, the another little trick I guess these companies play, which is underdosing key ingredients that actually do have good science that should be uh, in a pre-workout, something like beta alanine, for instance, or citrulline malate. Those are ingredients I like to see in pre-workouts. Um, there's good research backing them up. They improve performance, but you have to take enough. That's the key. In terms of beta alanine, you're going to want to be you're going to uh, want to be between four and five grams as to, to realize the the acute type of performance benefits that you'll see in research and in terms of citrulline malate you're going to want to be up around eight grams to uh, duplicate what you can what you will find in in you know the research that's out there 
So what companies will do though, is they know that things like beta alanine and citrulline malate have a good reputation among the fitness crowd and especially among people that are in the know and that, uh, you know, people like you, for instance, that want to be educated, they figure you're going to look, you know, over their ingredients and you're going to be looking for certain things. And when you see beta alanine, you're going to go, oh, that's good. It has beta alanine. Oh, it has citrulline malate. Okay, that's good. But what they're hoping that you don't know is dosages. And like I said, you need to be taking enough. Um, and then they use proprietary blends to hide the dosages or, or they don't, or they, if you just looked at it, maybe it has a gram of beta alanine per serving, or maybe two grams, two grams, you might notice something. Uh, you might get a little bit of the tingles, not that that's like proving that it works, but if, you, if you're not even feeling that, you're, you're taking so little that it's not going to do anything. Um, but two grams, you may notice a small performance boost. Uh, citrulline malate, again, you know, you might have two grams in a serving, you might notice a little bit, but you're not going to notice nearly as much as if you took the right amounts. Um, so what the companies do is they'll use these smaller dosages of good ingredients and then they'll just claim all the benefits that were shown in research where much higher dosages were used. Uh, another practice I don't like with pre-workouts is using uh, large amounts of caffeine or other stimulants, which I noted earlier. Um, it's not necessary. Well, it's, it's just a cheap way to make a product that hits you, but I don't like how it makes me feel and it's not particularly healthy to, to take that, you know, to max out your caffeine intake every day and, and take other stimulants. Um, so there's that. And there's also using cheap fillers like uh, creatine, in my opinion, it has no place in a pre-workout. It's, it's just a filler. It's a cheap powder. Yes, creatine is good. Yes, you should be taking creatine, but creatine doesn't confer any acute benefits. You're not going to take five grams of creatine and then go lift more weight or have more energy, you know, 30 minutes later or 20 minutes later. Creatine has to accumulate in your muscles. It has to build up, which is why uh, long-term, well, I would say if you were just to start with the standard loading type of protocol, 20 grams a day for seven days, by the end of that, you're definitely going to notice a difference in your workouts, probably by day four-ish or something like that. Uh, you'll start feeling, you know, some more strength in the gym. If you're doing five grams a day, it might take 10 days. It might take 14 days before you really start noticing it. So when your pre-workout has you know, a couple grams of creatine per serving, which is the standard, like if you look in the, lit in the literature, the standard dosage that's recommended for improving anaerobic performance, which includes muscle, or muscle uh, <clears throat> performance, is about five grams a day. So if your pre-workout has two grams a day, you're already kind of underdosing that. But you won't likely notice anything even from the creatine until you're a couple weeks in, <clears throat> and the average pre-workout bottles lasting uh, a couple weeks as it is. So it's just not an efficient, what we want from a pre-workout is we want something that we can take that will improve our workouts immediately or something that doesn't require, you know, a couple weeks of, of loading to uh, accumulate in the muscles and, and work. Um, so I don't like seeing creatine. Uh, there also is some research that caffeine and creatine together might not be a good idea, that caffeine may actually um, cancel out some of the muscular benefits of creatine. It's not totally understood yet, and it may just be a fluke. We're kind of waiting to see if more research comes out on it, but it's possible. So um, to be safe, I guess, in that regard, I always recommend that you just take your creatine with your post-workout meal, uh, which also then you're going to benefit from, from some uh, increased absorption from, from all the carbohydrates and the insulin. So um, another reason why I just don't think pre-workouts really need creatine. Another filler that you'll see in pre-workouts is maltodextrin. Uh, it's a carbohydrate powder, nothing particularly wrong with it, you know, in and of itself. Pre-workout carbohydrates are good. They help you lift more weight. Uh, they help, I mean, you're, you're definitely you're gonna have a better workout. If you compare like fasted training to let's say having some protein and 30 grams of carbs to having some protein and 70 grams of carbs before a workout, uh, the latter, the, the 70 grams of carbs is gonna be your best workout out of the three. And there's no question you have more energy, you're gonna be able to lift more weight. It just is what it is. But, you know, I'd rather, I don't need maltodextrin. I don't need carb powder in my pre-workout. I can eat some carbs. I can have some fruit. I can have, I like rice milk. I like, uh, you know, instant oatmeal, whatever. You can have something else. You don't need to have, you know, carbs added to your pre-workout. And it's often, uh, they're often, you know, maltodextrin is often added. Um, or, well, I wouldn't say often, certain products contain, uh, you know, anywhere from 10 to 20 grams of malto per serving because you're gonna, it, it is likely to improve your workouts a little bit. 
So but you don't need to be spending, you know, whatever, $40 though for a tub of like what's half, half of it's just maltodextrin. You can just eat a little bit more carbs. You just need to know. Uh, you know, another funny little thing that, that supplement companies will do is they'll use uh, chemical names of everyday compounds to just kind of mislead you and make you think there's something special or uh, something, you know, maybe even, maybe even illegal, right? Like certain type of drugs and things and whatever. Um, so you'll see like uh, the the chemical name for green tea extract, which uh, is epigallo 3 catechin 3 ob gallate. Um, long, strange, but you'll you'll see that. And a lot of that, that's green tea extract. Green tea extract's not bad, uh, but it doesn't really make sense to have it in a pre workout. Um, one three seven trimethylxanthine is just caffeine. So you'll see sometimes you'll see sometimes caffeine anhydrous, and then the one three seven trimethyl uh, xanthine written out and that's just more caffeine. So these are also, they're just little things to change your perceptions. That's all. And I don't like that kind of misleading stuff. And in case you're wondering why companies do all this kind of stuff, again, it, go, it comes back to making money. It's profitable. When you, when, when you use the proprietary blend and you're, you, you, you don't spend a lot of money on high quality, key, you know, the key ingredients with good research, because that's the thing, clinically effective dosages, uh, it's not cheap. You can't make a good pre-workout for $5 a bottle. You can't make it for, for $7 a bottle. Maybe if you have a good manufacturer and you're running a high volume, when you start getting to the $10 to $15 a, a bottle price range, you can make a, a good pre-workout. But when your business model revolves around spending as little as you can on production and as much as you can on marketing, you know, and you have three, four dollars that you can put into it. Well, you, even if you wanted to use that three or four dollars, honestly, uh, you just can't make a good product because I mean, you, you can maybe have two ingredients in your pre-workout that are actually properly dosed. Um, so instead, they just go this other route and they start filling it with a bunch of junk. They use proprietary blends um, and and cheap stimulants and things to try to produce a product that you're going to feel and tell your friends about. You know, but also allows them to make the, the type of margins that they're looking for and support the business model, which is just, you know, pouring tons of money into the marketing and sponsoring bodybuilders and other things and running ads, you know, big expensive ads in magazines and blah, blah, blah. So that's why they do that kind of stuff. And, you know, as a consumer, that's also why I always dislike proprietary blends and I pretty much just uh, refuse to buy products from companies that use proprietary blends just on principle because I think the proprietary blend needs to go. As I said, there's no, there's no such thing as proprietary research in this field. All, all the research on these ingredients are, it's publicly available. It's not like these, these supplement companies are putting up millions of dollars to do special uh, you know, research of in finding new molecules and finding new uses for other molecules. We're all going off of the same uh, publicly available research, really. And you, know, you, you pay for, for each individual paper that you want to read and you can find everything that you want that's out there. So the real reason for the proprietary blend is just to hide dosages. That is the only reason. So let's talk about now what type of things I like to see in pre-workouts. Caffeine is good in terms of stimulants. It's one of the stimulants that, uh, of course, not only do you, do you feel, it gives you energy, but it also can increase muscle endurance and strength. So um, a I don't like to see super doses of caffeine. I think the the upper daily limit uh, is about 0.8 milligrams per kilogram of body weight. Um, so I weigh about eh, 90 kilograms or so. So um, for me, you know, that would be a lot of caffeine. I would not want to be doing 700 milligrams of caffeine a day. Uh, I do, I do about uh, the pre workout that I take, which is actually the one that I've created myself. It has 350 milligrams of caffeine per serving, and I do one half of a serving uh, before a few of my lighter workouts, and then I do a full serving before a couple of my heavier workouts. So my intake is ranging. I also drink some green tea at night, but that's only, you know, I use uh, a tablespoon of green tea to make a big, you know, one and a half liter pitcher of it. So that's maybe, tw can't be more than 20 milligrams of caffeine, probably closer to 15. I do like my tea over steeped, so let's say 20. Um, so my, my daily intake is, is anywhere from 
one quarter to one half of that daily upper limit. Some people, you know, I know some people that really push that upper limit. And if they weighed 90 kilograms, like actually, you know, one of the, one of the guys that works for me weighs a little bit more than me. And, um, I mean, I've been telling him to slow down on it because, but he's been doing this for quite a, quite a while. He does uh, a couple of coffees. He's doing a full, full serving of, of the pre-workout every day. So he's probably upward, you know, up around six, 700 milligrams a day. I, that would just be too much for me. That would burn me out. I don't, I don't recommend that. So caffeine is good. You don't want a super dose. You don't want so little that you're not going to feel it, but, uh, anywhere from in terms of a, a serving, if it, if it gives anywhere from let's say 0.2 to 0.4 milligrams per kilogram of body weight, that is uh, enough to improve your performance in the gym. Beta alanine is a good ingredient. A lot of uh, a lot of good research out there that shows that it does give performance performance benefits when taken in high enough dosages. It's uh, a naturally occurring amino acid that limits the amount of carnosine which is a, a dipeptide, which is two amino acids combined. That's, uh, so it limits the amount of carnosine that's stored in the muscles. So as beta alanine levels increase, uh, so, do to, so do the intramuscular carnosine levels. And research has shown that when you supplement with beta alanine, at least when you supplement with enough of it, it reduces fatigue, uh, it improves the anaerobic exercise capacity, and it may even exhibit certain mechanisms that can increase the amount of lean mass you can gain over time. Um, that is not a fully understood mechanism, but uh, there is a possibility that it can do that as well. Citrulline, which I mentioned earlier, is also an amino acid, um, and it's sometimes used instead of its counterpart, L-arginine, to stimulate nitric oxide production. Citrulline is just better because L-arginine is just unreliable in the mechanism of how it stimulates nitric oxide production, whereas citrulline is more uh, consistent in, in this mechanism. And again, there's good research that's been done with citrulline, and it shows that uh, it can improve muscle endurance, it can relieve muscle soreness, and it can also improve aerobic performance. Betaine is another good ingredient. Betaine is uh, a compound that's found in plants like beets, and research has shown that supplementation with betaine can improve muscle endurance, it can increase strength, uh, it can increase growth hormone, insulin growth factor one production. Um, in response to acute exercise. So it's, it's particularly good for weightlifters. I also really like theanine, which is an amino acid that is uh, found primarily in tea, actually. And it provides a few different interesting type of benefits. So there's good clinical research out there that shows that supplementation with theanine um, and caffeine together can reduce the effects of mental and physical stress, can increase the production of nitric oxide, similar to, uh, similar to citrulline, and it also improves alertness, focus, attention, memory, mental task performance, and mood. Um, I found that the theanine-caffeine combo really, really works nicely. Um, it also seems to, you have, uh, you know, when you have caffeine, you have the, the energy high, but then depending on how, what your tolerance is like and depending on how much you take, you can have that crash. I found that theanine, interestingly enough, it smooths out the caffeine rush. So you don't have a huge spike and then you don't have the crash. You just have kind of a smooth on-ramp and then you have, uh, you know, in terms of the, the pre-workout that I use, I, I tend to feel it for about 45 minutes, 30 or 45 minutes. At least that's with half of a serving. I feel a bit more if I take a full serving. But so you have the energy comes on and then you have sustained, you know, higher energy levels and then it just comes back down to normal as opposed to like something that hits you uh, and, you know, get, gets you jittery for going for 20 minutes and then you crash. Um, so theanine is, um, you won't find it in very many pre-workouts, but it is an amino acid that I really like uh, to, to be included. Another interesting amino acid that has uh, good research behind it that you don't see in too many pre-workouts is ornithine, which uh, plays a role in the metabolic cycle known as the urea cycle. And this is the process whereby the liver converts ammonia into urea, which we then pee out. Uh, and we also sweat it out. And that cycle have impacts our, our physical performance. So research has shown that supplementation with ornithine particularly can reduce fatigue, feelings of fatigue, and particularly when you're, when you're working out for prolonged periods of time, so an hour, two hours, or whatever. If it's you know, a 15-minute workout, you're not going to feel it. But as uh, you're doing longer workouts, and especially uh, cardio-intensive workouts, you'll really feel a difference. So those are kind of like the cream of the crop, in my opinion, of, uh, of ingredients right now. Um, that I like to see in pre-workouts and in proper dosages, of course. Um, 
and if you start looking around, you'll see some of these ingredients in, in some pre-workouts, but they're usually in much smaller dosages than they need to be. Like go try to find a pre-workout that has eight grams of cit malate. Uh, citrulline malate is a form. Uh, it's citrulline combined with malic acid, which just helps with absorption. Um, or, you know, go try to find a pre-workout that has four to five grams of beta alanine per serving. Um, in a lot of cases, you'd have to take multiple servings just to get to those numbers. Um, and then, of course, not only is that expensive, but it comes with all the stims and stuff. It's not viable. You know what I mean? You'll, you'd probably be hitting 600 milligrams of caffeine in one go just to, if you're going to take three or four servings of something to get to clinically effective dosages of certain amino acids and other, uh, you know, if, if it does have these ingredients that are going to improve your performance. So with that said, that's why I just went about creating my own pre-workout. Um, I, I have a supplement company called Legion Supplements. And basically what I'm doing is I'm just making the products I've always wanted myself. I want product, I've always wanted products where all ingredients are just backed by sound, uh, published scientific literature that I can review from, uh, for myself, uh, where all dosages are clin at clinically effective levels that if you can't use enough of something, then just don't use it at all. Um, which means that formulations, you know, a lot of the formulations that are out there, they should be smaller. You shouldn't, when you have, you know, 30 ingredients in a product and it's a product that let's say, you're, let's say a multivitamin, something you're going to take one or two a day and it has 20 different ingredients. There's just no way to get the right dosages. You can't fit all that unless the pills were, were massive, unless they're like 50 caliber bullets. There's just no way to do it. Um, and, and the same goes for, for powders. You know, Think about it in terms of, of just volume. Um, a protein scooper is about 30 grams. That's a, you know, that's a protein scooper. So if you need eight grams of citmalate to be at the upper end of clinically effective dosages and you need let's say four and a half grams of beta alanine, well, you're almost at half of a protein scooper right there. So unless, I mean, even if the price weren't an issue, if you started throwing in everything you could uh, and, you know, at clinically effective dosages, you'd be talking about doing like 45 grams of powder a day for pre-workout. I don't think people want to do that. Um, so I always wanted to see products that have less ingredients, not necessarily a small amount of ingredients, but less ingredients, higher dosages. Um, and I wanted no artificial sweeteners, no artificial food dyes, no unnecessary chemicals or fillers. Like, do you really care that your pre-workout is bright red? No, I don't think so. Or, you know, do you care that it just looks like a natural, let's say, uh, like, my pre-workout, we have fruit punch and grape flavors. So the fruit punch, it's kind of a pinkish. It's, it's you know, it, it, but does that bother you that it doesn't have, you know, the, the red food dye to make it look like it's uh, some sort of, you know, uh, lab experiment type of, type of potion? I, it doesn't matter. And of course, things that taste good, um, I, I don't, I mean, they don't have to taste amazing, generally speaking, like with protein, for instance, if it tastes like a milkshake when you mix it with water, that's probably not a good sign. That means that there's a lot of stuff in there to, to, to get it to taste like that, that you probably could, can't even pronounce when you look at it the, on the label, just long, you know, multisyllabic uh, chemicals. Um, and I, I know now from, from the back end of uh, manufacturing, that um, there are, yeah, sure, there are plenty of things that you can do to, to you know, make things taste great, but there are, it entails adding a lot of different ingredients that um, I wouldn't be comfortable ingesting every day, so I'm not going to do that. Um, anyway, the point is I want, I want my supplements to taste good, but they don't have to be, you know, they don't have to necessarily taste the best. They just have to taste good. And, I, and then, of course, just deliver a good value per serving, not necessarily the cheapest because creating good products is not cheap. But each serving should deliver a high uh, amount of effective ingredients. And that's really the key when you're comparing products is look at what you're getting in each serving in terms of, uh, you know, effective ingredients, actual weight of them, how many grams of whatever is each server, each serving uh, containing versus the price. In some cases, you'll see that the best deal, what looks to be the best deal up front is really not if you're looking at it in terms of effectiveness, like take fish oil, for instance. So I want to do a, a fish oil, but I'm very picky with how I want to do it because I want the natural triglyceride form of the oil. I don't want the ethyl ester, um, which I actually talk about why on my website. I'll link it down below. Um, and I want a high potency or I want, I want a lot of omega threes per gram. I don't want to be, you know, eating a gram of fat to get 200 milligrams or 300 milligrams of omega threes. That'd be a low quality. Like your average low quality fish oil is probably 300 milligrams of omega threes per gram of fat and ethyl ester form, which isn't absorbed well by the body. 
uh, and there are other other issues with it. But um, you're at, then you take like a high quality fish oil, and it, it'll have anywhere from six to seven hundred milligrams of omega threes per gram of, of fat, and it'll be the natural triglyceride form, which is better absorbed by the body and just all around better, safer to take. Uh, so that type of uh, relationship exists with a lot of other different type of ingredients and things as well where you can go cheap um, and it you know you unless the consumer is really in the know they won't know but that's not uh, I mean that's not what I would want for for myself so basically um, just you know from the kind of leveraging the success that I've had and all the support I've gotten as an author and at muscle for life to just do my own line of supplements and now I'm just creating the products I want and uh, one of those products is a pre-workout and the pre-workout is called Pulse. Uh, I'll link it down below so you can check it out. And you know what makes Pulse special is really just the formulation. Um, it contains clinically effective dosages of caffeine, theanine, beta alanine, citrulline malate, ornithine, and betaine. And it's naturally sweetened. And uh, no food dyes, no unnecessary fillers. Uh, it has less than there's a tiny bit of maltodextrin in each serving, actually to prevent clumping and to uh, cut some of the bitterness of the amino acids. But it's less than one gram per serving. A serving has, I believe, I think it's 21 or 22 grams of effective ingredients. Like that's actual ingredients, like 20, 21, 21 and 22 grams of the, of the stuff I just named. And then you have. Uh, less than a gram and a half for everything else, which is a little bit of maltodextrin. And then you have a uh, sweetener, which is stevia and erythritol. Erythritol is a natural sh uh, sugar alcohol, so it's naturally sweetened um, and no food dyes and nothing else. It's just a very clean product and you feel the difference. That's what's great about it. You actually will notice the difference in the gym and it's not because you're just gonna be jittery and you know your heart pounding out of your chest. Um, gotten a ton of good feedback. Um, it's, it's always in the top five on Amazon. It's usually in the number one spot. Ironically, when I added the grape flavor, it was in the number one spot, Fruit Punch, for, I don't know, a week straight. I added the grape flavor and because of how Amazon's system is set up, that then, the sales, it doesn't count the sales for, for the two flavors together. It separates them. So that actually then knocked it down, fruit punch down to the number three spot and then put grape wherever it put it. But anyways, sell a lot of them, uh, you know, get a lot of good feedback. People really, really like it. And um, so, yeah, that's, that's basically what I've done about pre-workouts. And I'm always kind of looking for what else is out there. Um, always willing to try other things. And also just looking at what type of ingredients, uh, if anyone comes across anything different. I mean, I... Between me and my partner, and, and we have a, a very, very knowledgeable person that consults us, uh, very well educated, and just the perfect person to consult us in, in our research, um, because not only does he know a ton about this, about supplements in general, but he's also uh, been in the weightlifting for a long time, he, and, he, and he really kind of resonates with what we want to do. Um, so whenever we're putting together a product, we're kind of just building the ultimate whatever. So in terms of pre-workout, we start with what's the ultimate pre-workout? What's everything that we'd possibly want to put in there? Um, when we did that, so we did that first and then we sent it off to get quoted. The first quote came back at $70 a bottle <laughs> for my cost. Uh, so obviously that didn't work, but that's how we go about it. So we go, okay, so it's $70 a bottle. Now, what, what do we have? What are the most expensive? And then we find out it's actually interesting that certain ingredients um, that really aren't that important are really expensive, like alpha GPC. We wanted alpha GPC in it to put the amount of, uh, that we needed. It was going to cost something like $15 a bottle just for one ingredient. And it's not like, it's just not that important. Uh, it could be go, It can go off into a different product, like a neutro, like a nootropic or something like that. Um, so anyways, I'm going to link pulse down below check it out. I'd love to hear your thoughts on the formulation. Uh, and even if you don't buy my pro workout, I hope that I have helped at least steer you away from some of the shittier products out there. And uh, so you can make some better purchasing decisions. Um, I'll do some more videos like this um, to talk about, I mean, not just my stuff, but talk about the type of products in general, like fat burners, um, multivitamins, protein powder, and things like that. Um, just again, so you're a more informed and more educated consumer. And, uh, you know, together we can maybe kill off the proprietary blend and some of this other shady stuff that companies do and just kind of, you know, as, as a collect collectively just demand something better, basically. All right. Hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks again. See you next time.